Hey everyone, my name is Ingrid Josephine and I'm the events producer at Startspace. Welcome to Business Book Chat with our special guest today, Sarah Davidson, who I'll introduce to you shortly. Before we begin, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Bunurong, Boonwurrung and the Wurundjeri Waiwurrung people of the Eastern Kulin Nation and pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. I'd also like to extend our acknowledgement to the traditional owners of all the lands that you're joining us from today. Now, firstly, to introduce Startspace. We are a support service for early stage founders and business ideas for free and for everyone. We have a range of programs to help develop your business, including talks, workshops, mentoring and networking events, as well as hot desks at the State Library of Victoria for those who are looking for a place to work and connect in person. We also have a virtual community that you can loop in via our Slack channel. Whatever your background, age, industry or experience, and even if you're just starting out with an idea, we want to hear from you because we know that great ideas can come from absolutely anywhere. Find out more and join us at startspace.hq.com. Next on today's, to today's guest, Sarah Davison. So in Sarah's past life, she was a corporate lawyer looking for a caffeine fix when she accidentally ordered 10 kilos of tea from Japan. Her efforts to get rid of that excess tea became a side hustle business, the organic tea company Matcha Maiden. Since then, she has also founded a cafe in St Kilda, Matcha Milk Bar, and can be heard chatting to other founders about their yay moments in her Seize the Yay podcast. Sarah is also the author of Seize the Yay, Work, Rest and Play Your Way to Hashtag Life Goals, which was published in 2020 by Murdoch Books. Um, so this book is full of practical tips and life advice from Sarah's own business journey. From growing her side hustle and then founding multiple businesses, Sarah shares her experiences of discovery and creating success on her own terms, which is centered around happiness and fulfillment. Sarah has been guided by what lights her up and then focusing on the concept of seizing her own yay to drive her business success. So Sarah, thanks so much for joining us and for sharing your knowledge for this chat and in this book. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure and still a bit surreal, actually, to be invited to chats like this as an author rather than a reader. <laughs> it's, it's, it's exciting and uh, we thank you for your time to um, put all of uh, those things in a book. So what inspired you to, write, to you to write the book? Did you have a burning reason or a need to enlighten your readers about something that you discovered in your own business journey? Yes and no. I think I have always been a bit of a bookworm. I've loved reading since I was a young kid. That has also translated into a love for writing. And I've always been fascinated by linguistics and language and communication and the ability to word concepts in a way that hits home for someone else and might spark an emotion or a different thought pattern for them. And I suppose that's kind of been a bit of a common theme, even though I've done lots of different random things that don't necessarily connect, that communication and impact kind of piece has been something that stayed quite consistent but I don't think I knew what kind of book I would write and this is something that part of CCA is actually quite fascinated with is the idea that you might not know how you're going to do something you might know why but the how will change depending on what chapter in your life you're up to so even though I thought I had a book in me I didn't actually know what it was going to be about until a couple of years into the podcast I had actually only started crystallizing what the CZA philosophy actually meant through all these conversations. I think sometimes when you start before you're ready, you're actually tweaking your own beliefs and thought process while you talk to other people about them. And the, the idea to translate that into a book only happened, I, I have generally been quite proactive, but it was a bit reactive. Murdoch was wonderful enough to offer me the chance to turn this philosophy into a book form. And suddenly it made sense. And I think sometimes, you know, we do have big goals and we do have big plans and it's really important to have that kind of structure. But if you stay open-minded, then plans you never knew that you had can come, you know, fall into your lap really the way this did. And I thought, okay, I mean, why not? I would love to write this into a book. And it did two things. First, it, well, three things. First, it gave me the chance to write the books that I'd always had in my body. But the two main things were, I was writing things that I needed to hear and that I constantly need to be reminded of and that no matter how often I talk about them, particularly in the area of self-doubt self and imposter syndrome and comparison, 
I needed every single thing that I was writing about. And it came to me at a time when I probably needed that most as the level of noise around us all the time about direction and pathways and success and careers was um, becoming, it's becoming quite loud as the digital world accesses us more and more. Uh, so it gave me the chance to do that and to really consolidate. I feel like if you can explain a really complicated topic in a really simple way, that's when you know you fully understand it. So to put I know what I think, but to actually communicate it into a book without a guest to banter with was also quite a big exercise. Um, but the other thing was, it also gave me a chance to do something that I think everyone should do, which is just to put pen to paper about where you are in the world at certain chapters of your life, because the world moves so fast these days. And it, I sort of felt by the end that even if no one ever read it or no one else except my family enjoyed it, I have this comprehensive record of exactly who I am and exactly what I think about the universe at this point in time to always look back on, much like a diary. And so it was also a really cathartic and personally beautiful process so that by the time I got to the end and released it obviously into a pandemic when bookshops were closed, <laughs> I was like, it doesn't matter to me if, you know, sales would be amazing, but I enjoyed the journey of it so much because it taught me so much. And I have this keepsake forever that if anyone else learns something, it's a bonus. Um, but it was really, yeah, a, an incredible chance to write about things that I'm very passionate about, that I want to hear about, and that I think are still lacking, which is people really talking about the crappy side of, of our journeys and the, the tougher, disorientating, self-doubt racked, uh, tumultuous, burnout related sides of of life that don't get as much airtime. And I felt it was really important to be a bit more vulnerable and to, and to commit it to writing as well. It's one thing in a, in a podcast chat that's quite casual, but to commit that to writing and to reach more people uh, than, than just a podcast might was a great privilege. Yeah, so it's really, it really made it real and really made you reflect on what you'd done through your business and, and how that affected you. And, and then what is the silver lining and the advice that came out of that? Yeah. Amazing. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so what's the critical thing that founders need to do first when starting their business? Like what are the really important things to learn how to do yourself or to focus on? And then when should you engage a professional or get some outside help in the business? Yeah, that's such a great question and often the most difficult one. I think uh, one of the things I realized was a philosophy as I was writing it into the book, <laughs> actually quite a few things got a label for the first time when I had to write them down, is that really delicate balance between having really big goals and dreaming big beyond your reality so that you can constantly be growing and progressing, but planning small so that you don't overwhelm yourself with doubt and fear so much that you never actually get started. And particularly when you're starting a business, especially if you've never done it before, but even if you have, you've pretty much, you've got to start everything from scratch. You're starting a name, a team, a concept, a product, a supply chain. You know, it's not walking into a new job where you're, you're just applying a new set of skills within an existing structure. You're creating everything from scratch. So it can be incredibly overwhelming. So I think the first thing that any founder needs to do is, of course, write down the big picture of what you want this business to be, what big vision you have for the future and what your best case scenario would be, but then really break it down into what are the immediate, say, three to five steps that I need to do to make my idea from nil, a, a, an idea in theory, to something. And that could be as simple as registering the business name or finding a stockist or finding a manufacturer. Like there are so many steps that you need to do before most of the things that you worry about will become relevant. You've got a finite amount of brain space. Don't waste it too early. So we spent so much time at the beginning stressing about how will we ship internationally? How will we, you know, scale up and have a factory? And you don't start with enough orders to need a factory. So why was I even worrying about those things? Bring it back to, I often say, what, what do you need to sell one product? or to have one customer. Because if you can service one, if you can have the infrastructure set up for one product, you've got enough for 10, you've got enough for 100. And then you'll slowly grow into what you might need for a thousand and more. So definitely break down that list. And then I think it really depends on the nature of the business. But in most cases, aside from big tech operations where you do need an investor often from the very beginning, most businesses you can bootstrap for a lot longer than you think 
again, we over plan, we over prepare and we think we need, you know, you over complicate things so much and you can go off and invest so much money when actually I think a lot of it you can do yourself. We did everything with just two of us for the first six months. We packed the match ourselves. We sourced it ourselves. We did customer service ourselves. I still had my full-time job as a lawyer. And it's actually quite alarming how much you can get done and how much you can grow into the volumes that eventually need you full-time without consulting any extra help. So I wouldn't say go it alone and be a martyr and like try and you know be a lone wolf to your own detriment, always surround yourself with good mentors and good supporters and even just people like your family who are going to you know, help you believe that you can do it. But don't go and spend a whole heap of money before you need to because you're much more capable of Googling and, and upskilling along the way than you think. But it, it's generally when you get to that point where you can't do it all and where your business is stunting its growth by you trying to do everything and not doing any of it properly, that's when I think you need to delegate or when you realize your skill level has got to a point where you've got gotten really far, but you're holding the business back without someone else's expertise. And again, once you get to a certain point, there will be too many things for just one person to do. And the most important thing to delegate first are the things that anyone can do. There are some things only you are able to do, which is that high level decision making, the brand voice, the essence of where you want it to go and the high level strategy, the personal touch. But things like, you know, kind of repetitive customer service questions, FAQs, answering things like that, that doesn't need to be done by you. Anyone can do that. So delegate those things first. Yeah, awesome. Um, and so for founders to succeed in business, there are lots of practical things to do and learn, like we've just spoken about. But I wanted to ask you about the importance of self-confidence and self-awareness. So how much should founders be working on these traits alongside their entrepreneurial goals and, you know, their plans of the practical things that are helping the business move on and grow? I think that's such an important question because before I got into business, I thought so much of it was going to be about my own ability and my own, you know, my my physical and mental ability to learn the skills. It was all practical and it was all task-based. But actually the biggest obstacle, most people can learn stuff pretty quickly. You know, we're all relatively clever people. Google is alarmingly useful. YouTube gives you tutorials on absolutely anything. The learning is not the problem. It is all the mindset. So I think we don't put enough emphasis on getting that confidence piece right early. And I think most of the times that business ideas don't go ahead or don't flourish or don't succeed is not because the idea didn't succeed or because the founder wasn't able to do the job. It's because they didn't believe that they could do the job. And rather than having the right tools or the right networks to get them out of that and pull them out of that self-doubt and push them towards confidence again, they let it consume them completely. So I would say that's the thing you need to work on first, setting the right mental pathways to help you get through those moments and the right networks of friends around you who will also help you when you can't pull yourself out of it yourself. So my biggest thing is I have expected that as I get more capable and as we have more years of experience that one day I would wake up without self-doubt. I'd just be confident because, you know, we've proven that we can do it. But actually I've realized, particularly through the podcast and the book, the most successful people still experience that self-doubt and they actually harness it as a sign that you're not complacent. It's a good thing. It's a reflex that shows you you're stepping out of your comfort zone and proves to you that you care enough to do a good job. If I turned up to this chat and wasn't nervous, I think, why aren't you invested enough to worry that you know, to be a little bit on your toes, not of course, like falling apart all the time, but it just, it, that little butterfly feeling in your stomach is not a bad thing. What is a bad thing is if you trust those thoughts of like, am I good enough? Why am I here? Why do I deserve this? If you can't see them as a reflex and believe them, they're very destructive. If you can see them as a reflex and then push them aside and be like, thank you. Great. I'm not complacent. I'm pushing myself forward, but I'm not going to listen to you. That's when you can really move forward. And sometimes you might need to phone a friend for that. Make sure you're calling someone who isn't going to be like, maybe you're right. Maybe it's a bit too hard. You know, we all have a risk averse friend that maybe isn't the right port of call in that moment. Call someone who's going to be your biggest cheerleader and get you through. And with more practice, I think your self-doubt toolkit will get better and better as you learn and practice pushing it away. And you'll figure out 
all of us have different triggers. We might have quotes, we might have conversations, we might have little rituals or power poses or whatever it may be. Experiment around with what helps instill confidence in you and the actual implementation of the doing of starting a business, that is so easy compared to getting your head right. Yeah, great, great advice, Sarah. So um, in the book, you talk about venturing into new areas that you just had absolutely no experience in. You'd never um, started an FMCG business, FMCG business, so that's fast moving consumer goods. You'd never started a retail business. You'd never started a podcast. You'd never opened a cafe. <laughs> but you did all those things um, without experience. So how possible, like how possible, I mean, you're an example of it, but how possible is it that people who don't have business qualifications or experience in the industry they want to work in or, or solve a problem in, they don't have any startup capital or funding, they might not have a network of business mentors or people who can show them the way. Um, you talked a little bit before about dreaming big and plan small. Is that part of it or is there is there more to it to get someone started? I think it's uh, it's the most exciting time to be alive for the fact that once upon a time, even only one generation ago, all your decisions really were forever decisions. Your career was quite consistent through most of your life. Many of us, particularly as women, were, you know, my mum had the opportunity of teacher or nurse. There were just no other options. Whereas in our generation, you are expected to have nine to 12 different careers in your life, which means and has been accompanied by this um, enormous liberation of mindset towards jobs and chapters and the fact that the business and just general workforce environment has become more democratic, I think, than it ever has. So while once upon a time, even in business, people might have expected you to have an MBA or to have had some kind of incubator experience or be backed by another big name, you don't have to look hard at all to find complete outsiders, complete outliers who started with absolutely nothing, who have risen to the top very quickly because it's such a, you know, I think the digital age has made social media, has made audience building, has made uh, even the startup costs of you don't need a shop front for e-commerce anymore. You know, everything is so democratic. So there are no longer any big barriers to you. start. The barriers to entry are lower than they've ever been. And so I think that's why mindset is your biggest challenge is no one else is probably going to tell you no as much as you're going to tell yourself no yourself. But really with not much money and no experience, sometimes you actually have a, like a, a, a cutting edge that people who are experienced don't have because they only think in the way they've been trained. And not to say that it's a disadvantage to have a business degree, but sometimes thinking completely from a consumer-based perspective, most of the businesses that I know of, you know, whose friends of mine have started similar businesses have been from you as a consumer finding a gap and filling it because you're frustrated yourself. And that's as good as any perspective to lead to a good idea. And then of course, there's a lot of upskilling that's required. It'll be a steeper learning curve than you could ever imagine. And particularly for people like myself who were in an industry where they'd studied for seven or eight years to be where they were. I was so used to being overqualified for what I was doing. There's a lot of unlearning and a lot of discomfort in suddenly being okay with not having an actual clue at all of what you're doing. But if you just accept that and upskill in a different way and start to find new networks and new mentors in your new area, just like if you moved countries, you know, you'd find new friends, you'd find a new eyebrow lady, you'd find a new dentist, a new doctor. It's exactly the same thing. You change industries, you find new mentors. And I think that really means that anyone can be anyone they want to be now. And even if you take a few steps in the wrong direction or a few false starts, none of those are a waste either because you'll eventually land on something from the learnings that you get from those chapters. You'll land on something that is going to work and that is going to suit you the best. It's really actually a fantastic insight. It's never been a better time to start a business. And, and you're right that the barriers to entry have been removed. I mean, describing it as more democratic is a, a really um, smart way to put it that if you've got an idea, if you want to solve a problem, um, you can work it out. You can do it really cheaply, do it on the side while you're working in your main job. You don't need to give, you know, up your income and, you know, th go broke. Um, you can do it, do it on the side and build up and learn 
as you need to and, and grow into it. Um, so yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, so talking about growing into your business and then growing or scaling up, um, is there such a thing as scaling up too hard and too fast? Um, and is it harder to keep your business values and purpose as the business is growing? So, you know, have you got any advice here to help entrepreneurs and business owners to succeed, but in a sustainable way? Yeah. And we're not talking, you know, about environmental sustainability, <laughs> particularly we're talking about, you know, making sure that the business doesn't fall over or the business founder doesn't completely fall over. Absolutely. I think, well, firstly, or from, both. A, yeah. <laughs> from a personal perspective, I think that's probably more of a challenge is to make you last the distance because the burnout is real and the temptation is more strong and tempting than it has ever been for me because in a job where there's structure and where you're an employee, you have, inbuilt sick leave, you have inbuilt annual leave, uh, you have a support structure of, you know, bosses and superiors who can step in, you know, there's, there's so much support there for you to pace yourself a little bit more. And also a bit of an incentive that when you're being employed by someone else, and it's all for someone else's benefit, at the end of the day, you're ready to clock off. When it's your own business, and every single time you work hard, you see a direct result, why would you ever want to slow down? There's no incentive. So, Personal sustainability is a huge challenge and it is really, you know, people say, listen to your body, slow down when you feel the need. You will never feel the need because the adrenaline will make you think you've got fake energy because you're so excited about it. So the biggest learning curve for me personally was how to manage my own over-enthusiasm because I would do this vicious cycle of burnout, wipe myself out to zero, then forget that I did that, go back to 110%, burn out again and like it just... You've just got to learn to hold back a little bit, like 80, 90% so that you can last the distance. Part of that is choosing what is a sustainable way to scale up because your energy, you are the business. So you'll get caught up in whatever pace you set. And you have to remember you choose where the pace that you go at. You have a lot more control than you think. And there definitely is such a thing as scaling up too hard, too fast. For example, many times we... We scaled dramatically in the first little while and that was that was scary in that it was such a big increase in purchase orders the money started to get a lot bigger so the risk started to get bigger uh, and just needing to actually keep up with that kind of demand meant we had to swap factories you know we were upscaling and making choices too probably a little bit too quickly but the biggest risk I think is that you then get on a pattern of, okay, well, we're growing. So should we go from ordering 1,000 bags to 100,000 bags at once? Because then they'll go down to 30 cents. You know, it's really hard to over-prepare so that you're never left too short, but not so far that you're left with a product that, you know, you figure out, oh, we've ordered 100,000 of these bags because we thought they'd be cheaper and then they were the wrong size. Or, you know, and then it turns out our customers wanted something completely different. It's a very, very difficult line. It's so hard to know what's the right amount. And sometimes we've underestimated many times and we've been left without stock because we were like, oh, we can't afford to order 100 kilos this time. And is anyone going to buy it? And, you know, it, it's a constant push-pull of like how hard to scale. But I definitely think you're more at risk of getting a bit overexcited and over-preparing, like I said before, just worrying about situations that aren't relevant to you yet. So we scaled hard into the US, but we invested in all this infrastructure way before we'd grown into that kind of volume, way before we needed it. And we sunk so much money into it before, you know, that money was needed in much smaller level, uh, smaller levels of volume, but to satisfy the customers who were loyal, who we already had. So yeah, it's a very difficult situation. It's um. That's where I think you call in mentors who have done it before, who are a little bit further ahead of you, who can maybe help guide you to where the next step is going to be. And another thing that happened to us probably around the three or four year mark when that adrenaline and reactivity slows down and you stop just scaling up because everyone's, you know, the de demand is coming and you start to have a bit more like, okay, we're stabilizing everything. It's not plateauing, but it's calming down enough that we can choose now what we do. There are sort of three levels of business. There's this startup small level where actually because you don't have a lot of staff, you often don't have an office, you're really bootstrapping it, you actually are quite profitable. Then there's this middle scale up band where 
you're doing a lot bigger volumes, but not quite big enough to get the really good economies of scale and good discounts on shipping and packing and packaging and all that kind of stuff where you actually, you're working much harder than down here, but you're not making as much money. Then you hit this huge economies of scale and you're making money again. And you're operating at this massive, like hundred, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of purchase orders, but really good discounts, lots of staff, high efficiency. And we actually got to this middle bound and found like, this is not good. We're working so much harder than we were. We're not getting to this stage. We've left this stage and we're just, it's like, we're just killing ourselves all the time, but not to get to the next bit. So we actually chose to say no to that next band, which for us would have been going into major supermarkets because as I got, you know, you mentioned business values. As we moved into that phase, I missed, I walked away from all customer interaction. Suddenly I was in a factory wearing a high vis vest all day and doing all kinds of logistics and strategy planning, which is amazing and another big learning curve. But my jam is the people and the product development and the, the marketing and the events and the community. And I think we get really bogged down in bigger is better. Like my revenue is going up, so it must be better for me. And yeah, it's so successful and everyone's seeing the growth. But if you're really unhappy in that growth day to day, just choose to stay at a level that's sustainable for you. And for me, that was not doing that. That was staying in more boutique distribution. That was staying in focusing much more on e-com than on the big stockists that, you know, look flashy on the outside, but don't actually earn you nearly as much money or give you as much flexibility during the day. So it all comes down to your priorities, your business values, but also your strengths and what part of the business you want to be in. And the bit that I want to be in is only possible for me if it's a much more closely held smaller business, which is still big, but uh, I think you have to take the ego out of a lot of these decisions. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's a good steer about really reflecting on where you want to be and going back to your business values working out the landscape and the environment that the business is working on and say, okay, we need to bring in some advice. We need to bring in some mentors. And we also need to learn from, you know, getting to similar little stages before, like how did we get over little hurdles and challenges? Think about what the learnings are from there and then get advice as well. Um, Awesome. Um, So I'd love to ask about resilience and maintaining your yay for business owners out there. Um, And there's a section of the book about if you're going through hell, um, keep going. Um, So I wanna ask actually a multi-question. One, can you um, speak to us about Yay and why it's really important um, and give some some practical tips on um, how to keep going when it's tough and why you should keep going. Um, And as well, like when you shouldn't keep going. Yes. Oh, okay. So yay. Uh, the whole idea of yay came about because I was what I now refer to as seizing the day for so much of my life. I was going after every opportunity, which is not a bad thing. It's so good to be curious and to always be pushing yourself, but sometimes you get so caught up in the momentum and gratification of productivity that you realize you're like seizing all these opportunities, but you're not actually asking yourself if you want them or if they're the right ones for you, or if they're taking you any closer to where you want to be. And so I ended up just being really busy and really run down all the time for no particular reason and in no particular direction. For example, I would look at my superiors in my legal career and I I didn't hate my job at all. It was a wonderful launching pad, but I didn't want to be them. And it was sort of like, well, why are you sacrificing so much of your life for this career where you don't want to progress? Like, what's the actual trajectory there? So yay came about when I realized that I was just working to sleep, to sleep, to work. And that's great. I mean, some people, even if you love your work, that can be really satisfying, but you're not meant to work and die. That's just not what we're here for. There's this whole piece of about pleasure and leisure and joy and I don't mean that you have to enjoy your job every single day. That's not realistic and it's not what work has ever been meant for. I mean, reality of life is you pay bills. It's only our generation that needs to be passionate about their job all the time. But you need some level of joy and some connection to what suits you best and what brings you that feeling of excitement to be alive. For many people, they want some of this in their job. Some people find that they that if they turn their passions into their job, like for example, musicians or creatives, if they have a brief and they have a deadline and they have a budget, suddenly it's not joyful. So it doesn't have to be job related. We just all need some focus in our lives on the feeling of yay. And I think you can survive for a really long time without that and not realize what you are actually missing out on in life. 
So for me, obviously that happened in a big career transition. But the next level of that was that as soon as I got into business, I started to corporatize my business and do exactly the same thing. I love my job, so I'd work too hard and I'd make no time for play or joy. Even though I was joyful at work, I had no other joy. And I think you're better at everything you do. You're a better worker. You're a better business person. You're a better friend. If you take time off and just do things you love that have nothing to do with productivity. So that's where yay came in for me. It's a really juvenile word. And the publisher actually made me think about whether I wanted to use that word. But because it's so childlike, it makes me not take myself too seriously. And remember, like, there is no better word to describe that feeling of electricity in your body than yay. Like, there's just no other word. You know, it's so sparkly. So getting back in touch with that helped me make better career decisions, but also helped me make better personal decisions about, you know, my job suddenly became very focused on wellness and self-development, but now that can't be my play. I can't go and walk walk the dog and listen to a Tim Ferriss podcast because I'll start thinking about what book I should write or what thing that I should do that's productive related to that. So I've had to like kind of quarantine a side of my life that's got nothing to do with productivity or being busy. And, uh, I think that's the bit that we're all missing is we're so focused on goals that anything that isn't a goal is a waste of time, but actually wasting time is one of the most important ways to use your time (laughs) that we just don't allow ourselves to do anymore. So that's, that's that. The resilience part, I think a lot of the really tougher times in my journey have been because I didn't make time for that which led to not just physical burnout, but real mental burnout, mental and emotional burnout to the point of quite crippling clinical anxiety, panic disorder, just total breakdowns of so resistant to using my brain because it couldn't cope with how much I was smashing it with stimulation that I'd have to take months off work. And I mean, when you run your own business and you're the only full-time employee, that's a disaster and that's your livelihood. And that it's suddenly not looking after yourself goes from something that you wear as a badge of honor to an actual irresponsible decision as a business person. Like that's not a good thing to do. (laughs) It's irresponsible and it's hypocritical because my business was wellness focused. So I think in that first and second of many major health breakdowns, they are the lowest points from which I realized that adversity and discomfort is actually when you make your biggest breakthroughs in health, but in everything. And so that saying of, if you're going through hell, keep going. I now look at any kind of discomfort or challenge as a growth opportunity, because you actually don't grow when things are going according to plan. And you don't really grow when things are going really well. I mean, you want those times, but they're not the growth phases where you have big eye-opening, life-changing revelations. For me, it was that I have limits and that I have to respect them and that life needs to have some joy in it. For other people, it might be non-health related and non-career related. You know, it's just if for whatever reason adversity comes into your life, which it will inevitably, that's how you recognize the good times firstly, but that's also how you evolve as a human being. So the reason that things happen often doesn't make sense at the time. Um, And another one of these is failure. I think a lot of things happen where they're just major screw ups and it feels like a total failure that you're never going to recover from. My attitude now towards that is you either win and it goes how you want or you learn. There's really no failure because in every case, all you need to say to yourself is this screw up saved me from a much bigger screw up that I could have made in the future. It could always have been worse, always. So if you see every back step or dark time as teaching you something for next time and just trust that even though if you don't know what that lesson is now it will become clear because it always does makes it easier to get through it just sit with it and it lasts until it lasts do the things that nurture you until you can feel like you again but stick with it because there'll always be something that it some strength that it gives you that one day in years or months or whatever it may be you'll be like I couldn't have done this unless I went through that fantastic advice and and when people should stop doing things or maybe take pauses when they are having you know a really serious health crisis or issue um, or something in the business has really gone actually so wrong that you need to call in professional advice uh, so don't keep going through those points get uh, get outside help and advice um, alongside that learning piece too um, absolutely awesome so um, 
I've got a last question to wrap up on, Sarah. So what is one piece of practical advice that you want to give the audience to take away today, either for their career, their business, success, or just some personal advice? I think the most life-changing practical thing I have ever done is make time, like physically carve out in my calendar with the same colour as I would a work meeting, make time for wasting time. Make time for things that have no productive outcome, no learning opportunity. I can't win at it. I'm not trying to be better at it. That is purely for some random activity. And the, the way I define those activities are, what are the things that make you forget what time it is? If you're so immersed in it that you detach from what when in the world you are and where in the world you are, you are giving your brain the best break it could ever have from every other minute that you spend awake, stimulated and trying to think and grow and learn. And since I've done that, not only has my mental and physical health been better, everything else in life is happier and richer and more full because you just indulge in in joy and it's contagious through the rest of the activities that you do. And it doesn't have to be like new mums will kind of tell you, well, when am I going to make time for play? It can be like two minutes. It can be a ritual like lighting a candle when you otherwise would be thinking sensibly about wasting $2 when you burn a candle. You know, every every second of a candle burning is another like $2. But it's those things that you indulge in no matter what, because even if they're wasteful, they're enjoyable. So like a Netflix binge, for me, it's I love crime and I love reading crime because I'm not trying to be a criminal. So I don't you know, psychologicalize myself into like, how can I be a better criminal? Like I'm not trying to win at that activity. And it just takes me always a bit of escapism. And that makes me feel at the end of like a half an hour reading session, I can go back to my work and I feel like I've been away from my work for hours, even if I haven't. So yeah, I think if you make time for your joy, even a small amount per week, per day, whatever, everything else feels more joyful and feels more manageable in your life. You don't get as overwhelmed. You don't get as burnt out. You don't get as run down. And you also never get to the end of your life and think all I did was work and sleep. Yeah, that's, that's really great advice to just embrace escapism, joy, time off. And that will impact your whole life and your business in ways that you didn't expect. Because Mm -hmm. when your brain is switched off from all of the operations and strategy, you could come up with some brilliant idea while you are taking a walk and not really thinking about anything and to actually just give your brain space and time to just do whatever it wants to do without you um, controlling we've got to go to this meeting I've got to do that spreadsheet then um, who knows what could happen and I think you'll find if you reflect the best ideas that you've ever had are generally just after a holiday or a break always mine randomly match a maiden came in Hong Kong, the CZA was on the top of a mountain in Tasmania. Like it's always once you detach from the the doing, that have suddenly forced it. Yeah, and you have your brain has space finally. If you don't give it space, how can it think? Oh, that's so great, Sarah. So that's all we have time today. So I'd just like to recap with a, some tips from Sarah. So I think number one that we've come um, out with through this chat is. Um, Really first, you've got to work on your mindset as a business owner or if you're an employee working on a career, you're not quite sure whether you want to start a business, but you might have a side hustle in you or you might have a book in you. Um, So work on your mindset, work on self-belief and also have a network of friends or business advisors around you who can bounce off um, to really help you understand your goal and what to do next. Um, in terms of people who are starting their business, um, they're in the early stage, what to do first, like immediately work out the first three to five steps that you have to do to get that first customer, to get that first sale, to actually prove the business is a success. Like you just need to do three to five steps, get one customer. Um, And also that bootstrapping is something that you can do for longer than you you think. And there is a lot of DIY um, and on the cheap and proving a really simple MVP is the way to go. Um, And then later on, once you've actually proven that, got that first customer, got those first 10 customers, 
getting to the stage of 100 customers is where you're going to look for funding, put more um, planning and strategy into the business and, and grow into what you need to do as you get to that point. Um, and also delegate things that other people can do for you. If you are, you know, the spokesperson, the founder of the business, obviously that's your role, but you don't need to be, you know, data entry, customer inquiries, packing bags once you've got to that point of growth. Um, so, you know, think about how you best serve the business and how other people can help you. Um, so to read Seize the Yay, um, work, rest and play your way to hashtag life goals. Um, you can access the book in the collection of the State Library of Victoria. Or you can buy your own copy from our friends at Readings Bookshop in the State Library of Victoria or online at their website. So Sarah, where can people head to learn more about you and connect? I think uh, the best place is Spoonful of Sarah on Instagram. Everything else is linked to there. That's sort of the hub. I live on the internet, so you can find me there. <laughs> so great. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate you sharing with us today and for creating this helpful resource for business owners and lots of practical life advice. So for those out there in the audience, please give Sarah a virtual round of applause. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.